we'll um, start there, but I'm sure a few more will join us over the next few minutes. Um, firstly, many of you might notice I'm not David Norgrove. Um, unfortunately, he can't make it today, so I'm going to cover for him um, and Ed will do some closing remarks on his behalf. Um, but hopefully we've still got a great selection of panel members, so we can still have a very good discussion. Um, it's great to see so many people here to celebrate 30 years of the UN fundamental principle of misuse. I'm sure you've all read in the notes that this is around statistical agencies are entitled to comment on erroneous interpretation and misuse of statistics. And this is clearly really important and a lot of the work we do in the Office for Statistics Regulation and UKSA um, is relevant to this principle. Um, before we get into the topic, uh, there are of course a few housekeeping items to share with you. Um, first, the session is being recorded and there will be um, a transcription, um, so we just want to make everybody aware of that. Um, second, and perhaps most important, is you can join Slido to put your questions in. The code is there, and um, hopefully you can read it, 913675. There'll also be a link going in the chat. And um, please do add your questions as we go along, and we'll come to them at the end of the panel discussion. And of course, please do share your experiences um, using the hashtag FPOS30. Um, I don't want to um, jump too far ahead. Um, I'll leave those on there so you can go to Slido. Um, what I wanted to cover briefly in these opening remarks is just to um, highlight obviously how important this topic is um, and of course introduce our speakers. So thankfully in the UK misuse of statistics is rare and we're really lucky to have the structures in place which support um, statistics that serve the public good. Um, and Ed Humpherson um, is Director General in the Office for Statistics Regulation and will tell you more about that role in the UK. But I think it's also really valuable to have the international perspective. So we're really pleased to be able to welcome Dominic and Steve um, to tell us a little bit more about their experiences. Um, so Dominic is President of Statistics Poland and also President-elect of the International Association of Official Statistics. And Stephen is a regional advisor on statistics at UNECE um, and also has experience at ONS, Eurostat and OECD. Um, so I will pass over to them for the discussion, but please do start adding your questions into Slido whenever you're ready. Thank you. First, we'll start with Ed. Thank you very much, Mary. If we could move on to the next slide, please. That would be great. Thank you. So I'm Ed Humpherson, as Mary says, I'm the head of the United Kingdom's Office for Statistics Regulation. Uh, and uh, the core of our work is to set the standards uh, that any government department or agency publishing statistics must meet. Uh, we set those standards and then we uh, uphold them in various ways. Uh, but we're perhaps most uh, visible um, in the uh, in the UK for what we do when we have concerns about the way statistics are being interpreted. Uh, that's where we stand up for statistics visibly. And if we can move on to the next slide, you will see that uh, we get a, a good deal of media coverage when we make these interventions. Uh, this is just a selection of screenshots from various uh, things we've done mostly around the pandemic, but we intervene on on, on many other topics uh, as well. So I think you could tell the story of our work uh, with uh, an emphasis on the sort of the, the big impacts we secure in terms of media reporting of us confronting um, misinterpretations of statistics. But actually, I don't want to do that. I want to sort of go uh, back a stage and think about why we do this and how we do it and contextualise this work that we do to stand up for statistics. So if we could go on to the next slide, I think you have to click through a couple of, uh, of animations, Bethan, to get there. So we, um, we start by thinking about the context in which we live. We think that the pandemic has revealed uh, that there's an in a very significant public interest in statistics and data. Uh, members of the public often sitting on their sofas at home, engaging with 
statistics and data, wanting to understand what's going on, wanting to understand how many infections there are and how many hospitalizations there are and so on. We call them armchair epidemiologists. Now, in a way, we don't think this is a new phenomenon. It's just been exposed and exaggerated by the pandemic, this growing public life of statistics and data. And if you can just click again, Bethan, uh, we see this interest, not just uh, if you could just shift forward one slide. Thank you. Um, uh, it, it, we see this interest in the public appetite for statistics and data, uh, and we also see it in policymakers increasing emphasis on the use of statistics and data as a tool of government. And that is really where our role comes in as the Office for Statistics Regulation. Our role is to ensure that that supply of statistics and data to the public, to policymakers, is TQV, it's trustworthy, high quality and high value. And the vast majority of our work is sort of upstream of the, the big public debates. It's looking at individual sets of statistics produced by individual government bodies uh, or looking at groups of statistics and saying, do they, do they serve the the, 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 the public's interest in statistics. However, as part of that, we will from time to time think that even though the statistics are published and made available, we need to clarify their appropriate interpretation in public debate. And that's when we make these interventions that we call standing up for statistics. And we do so with some very clear principles. The first is that we do not want to become a referee of political debate. Let me give you a very clear example of that. Uh, recently uh, in the UK, there's been a debate about living standards um, with rising inflation and, and, and so on. And uh, the government said that one of the things it was doing uh, to support living standards was um, by getting people into work and that there were more people in employment now than there were before the pandemic. And we stepped in um, after raising our concerns privately with the government, uh, we stepped in publicly, as the use was repeated, to say the statistics do not say that. They do not say that employment is higher than it was uh, before the pandemic. The statistics say the opposite. Uh, and we stopped there. We didn't say, and therefore your arguments about living standards are wrong. There, we didn't say, Therefore, you're, you cannot argue that you're doing a good job for the country. We simply stepped in to clarify what the statistics did in fact say. That's what we mean by not being a referee of political debate, focusing on the statistics and not on the broader arguments, which is the proper and appropriate stuff of politics. Our second principle is that we do not chase media coverage. Our interventions do secure media coverage. We do get uh, the kinds of screenshots so that I showed in my previous slide, but we don't chase that. Uh, a really good example of that is during the pandemic, we raised concerns about the statistics being reported on testing, out of capacity for testing. When we made that intervention, it was a subject of intense interest and we could have filled our time by going from new studio to new studio, giving interviews and talking up this, this story. And we felt and we always feel that that sort of chasing of media attention is not appropriate. We want to forensically step in, clarify the appropriate interpretation of the statistics and step out again. The third principle when we do this is uh, that we want to focus on institutions and statistics and not personalities. And actually one really important thing about that is quite often when there are cases of misinterpretation, it's actually at least in part because of the way the statistics are being presented, which leaves them prone to misinterpretation. Um, in the past, there's been quite a, a habit of uh, um, misinterpretation of statistics on crime uh, and, and quoting uh, changes in crime rates, which are not supported by the underlying evidence. But that's at least in part because of the way crime statistics have been presented in the statistical outputs themselves. So we want to focus on the institutions and the statistics, not on the personalities using the statistics. Uh, and as I say, a lot of the issues are derived from how um, in, uh, institutions are reporting statistics, not how politicians are using them. And the final thing that we, we, we have as a principle is that this is all about ensuring the public has access to data and statistics to inform them about, about society. In other words, this is not about fighting politicised debates. It's about the public access to data and statistics, uh, recognising that we are all armchair epidemiologists now. That's an extremely quick 
uh, tour of the work that we do. Be very happy to take any questions, um, but nothing more to say from me now and happy to pass uh, pass back to you, Mary. Thank you very much. Um, and as a reminder, hopefully people can see the link in the chat, but do add your questions at slido.com and the passcode is 913675. Um, and now we'll pass on to Dominic. Thank you very much. Uh, th thank you very much. It's a it's a honor for me to be here today. Uh, I think the topic is extremely important uh, to whatever the country you may think of. Is it a developed country like the United Kingdom? When you have said, you know, you have a lot of, you know, uh, institutions uh, uh, responsible for for safeguarding uh, misuse of statistics. I mean, so, so guarding against misuse of statistics, or whether it is a developing country which is at the beginning of setting up its, uh, you know. Uh, firm institutions, public institutions, and, and they have to face those things that usually the developing countries are facing at the beginning stage. Uh, 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 I just want to start with something that is very generic, but it's very important to me because I had some even clashes with my colleagues recently, you know, discussing these issues uh, internationally. That, um, you know, uh, what is misuse? Uh, I would say that misuse is, uh, is distorting the truth is distorting the truth. This is what I think uh, misuse is. We are trying to affect the truth in a way that is favorable to whatever the communication we want to achieve, to whatever, whatever goal we want to achieve. You know, if you're an evil person or an evil organization trying to do this misuse case, misuse, uh, you know, misuse, you know, and, and then if, if this is distorting the truth, then uh, what comes to my mind is that the truth itself is the most essential the ultimate value of official statistics that what we are trying to actually achieve in official statistics is something that is so well written in the American Constitution when they when they claim that they pursue the happiness. So what we should do in official statistics, in my opinion, is to pursue the truth, not true image of something, not accurate, relevant, timeliness. These are, of course, important dimensions of quality that we very often mention and characterize our, our uh, statistics by. But uh, those are meaningless if you don't have a reference point. And this reference point is truth. It's like an estimation theory. You try to find the unknown value of the unknown param of, of the param parameter, uh, which you believe is true. And uh, that's what we're trying to do uh, doing our statistics. And uh, basically, if we uh, stress enough well and enough hard that this ultimate you know, objective of what we're doing, of what we're doing is the truth and achieving the truth and conveying the truth to the society, then uh, it will you know, set up a, fra uh, you know, a framework in which we are able to easily, or more easily recognize misuse or to more easily find the misuse or to more easily find strength in ourselves to find the misuse, which is sometimes very hard, you know, depending on our political systems, depending on other uh, 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 conditions, uh, uh, environments around us. So. Uh, we need to have this absolute point, I would say. This is like the origin of the coordinate system to me. And, uh, we need to build a relationship with something as profound as truth is, because what better can we have on our side than the truth itself? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I'll pass straight on to Stephen. So thank you very much for inviting me to join this uh, panel and to discuss this very interesting topic. And good morning from Geneva, which is the home of the fundamental principles of official statistics and the organization that created them. Uh, the one that I work for, the United Nations Economic Commission for Europe or UNECE. So we're one of five regional commissions in the United Nations system. Uh, we cover the geographical Europe, but also North America, Israel and the former Soviet republics in Central Asia. So a total of 56 countries are, are actually UNECE members. But our reach doesn't stop there because we also encourage countries all around the world to join our activities on a voluntary basis, and many of them do. 
So our main activities are really that we provide uh, forums for sharing ideas, best practices, uh, new developments in many areas of official statistics. Uh, we also focus on capacity development to help spread those ideas throughout the statistical community. And a very important part of our work is developing statistical norms and standards. And when we talk about norms and standards, perhaps the best known of these is the fundamental principles of official statistics. These fundamental principles were really born in the early 1990s as a response to the shifting political landscape in Europe at the time. Uh, we had the collapse of communism across Eastern Europe and the breakup of the Soviet Union. And this was resulting in many newly independent countries and countries undergoing quite dramatic transitions. And against this background, the international statistical community saw a clear need to try to establish a set of basic principles that would help to guide statistical work. To help guide statisticians through those challenging times and to provide a sound basis for developing robust and trusted national statistical systems. Now, although the fundamental principles started in the European context, they've gradually spread to become a global standard and that culminated in their unanimous adoption by the UN General Assembly in 2014. And that's the first time that a statistical standard has achieved that sort of uh, endorsement at the political level. Now, of course, the work didn't necessarily stop there because having a set of principles is one thing, but actually implementing them is another. And really, that's that's the core of the discussion today, I think. Uh, our work in UNECE is very much ongoing. Uh, we developed a generic law of official statistics to inform the modernization of statistical legislation worldwide to anchor the principles in legislation. And we've recently started some new work that Dominic alluded to on defining the core values of official statistics. So Dominic and I are part of a group working on that, uh, together with Nikki Sherman of ONS and representatives of around 10 other countries, uh, chaired by Padraig Dalton, uh, the head of CSO Ireland. But this year, as we celebrate uh, 30 years of the fundamental principles in our region, it gives us an excellent opportunity to reflect on how they've been implemented around the world and how they shape the development of official statistics. So this session today is an important part of that reflection, looking particularly at uh, fundamental principle number four. Now, every two weeks, in the lead up to the formal celebrations of the 30th anniversary of the fundamental principles at the Conference of European Statisticians in June, we're highlighting a different fundamental principle. And in this, we're partnering with various countries around the world and different countries are taking the lead for the different principles. Uh, so far, Canada has uh, led a successful introduction to the campaign, focusing on principle one, on relevance, impartiality and equal access. They handed the baton to New Zealand, who focused on principle two, on professional standards and ethics. And then uh, more recently to Finland and Latvia, who've been taking us through principle three on accountability and transparency. And then as of today, uh, we're starting now on principle four. Uh, statistical agencies are entitled to comment on erroneous interpretation and misuse of statistics. And I'm very happy to see that UK is taking the lead on this, given the excellent work that has been done in the UK statistical system on this point over the last 15 years or so since we had the really quite disastrous uh, survey on uh, trust in statistics, which showed a really big uh, issue in the UK. And part of addressing that issue has been to try to uh, establish the role of the statistical system in the UK as a, a tool for providing truth, as Dominic said, uh, as a tool for really providing trusted information. And a key part of that is to be able to flag 
uh, erroneous interpretation, whether it's deliberate or not, and particularly misuse of statistics to call out where that misuse is perhaps misinforming uh, public opinion based on a, a wrong interpretation of data. So I look forward to a very interesting and useful discussion on this topic. Thank you. Thank you very much. And that's really interesting and really good to get a little bit more background on the other events going on around um, the celebrations. And um, there are questions coming in fast, which is really good. But before we go to Slido, I'm going to ask um, the panel one question on my own, if that's OK. Um, I was really interested, Stephen, in what you said about it being a guide for statisticians and Dominic in your um, points about pursuing the truth. So I wondered if any of the panel members or each of you could give a view on how far statistics producers are responsible for misuses, um, accidental or willful, um, which arise as a result of their presentation of the stati statistics and what you think producers of statistics can do about this. I don't know, Stephen looks like he's nodding, so perhaps he'd like to go first. Yes, thanks. I think this uh, links in uh, to some extent to uh, what we've just been uh, working through with uh, Finland and Latvia on the third principle. And that is about uh, the responsibility of statistical organisations to facilitate a correct interpretation of the data. And that involves uh, all sorts of aspects of presentation. Uh, the fundamental principles uh, refer to presentation according to scientific standards. Uh, with information on the sources, the methods and the procedures, etc. And I think this is very important in the context of, of being transparent uh, to try to give a, a clear and simple presentation of the data so that people can hopefully get a, a good understanding. Uh, we in, in UNECE, together with various countries some years ago, produced a, a series of publications on making data meaningful which addressed some of these presentation issues and highlighted good practice. And I'm very happy to see that they've been reflected in guidelines in the UK and many other countries on how to present statistics in a way that uh, minimizes the risk of uh, misinterpretation. And we're constantly working on this topic. Uh, we bring together every year a group of communications experts from national statistical offices around the world to discuss the, their, their ideas, their good practices on how to present statistics in the, the best way to try to minimize the risk of, of misinterpretation. So it's, uh, I think, an area where statistical offices have to take some responsibility. Uh, it's key to be able to uh, understand how the way that the data are put out there can affect the, the way that they're understood. Thank you. Thank you. Dominic, I'll give you um, the next chance to respond. Uh, th thank you. I, I think the key word here is responsibility itself. You know, uh, we need to feel this responsibility within our offices to really um, think about that not only the misuse or misinterpretation that happens, but also to project into the future what can we do to prevent it, and 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 to realize that sometimes we may ourselves, you know, lead to a situation that uh, uh, you know creates this, you know. Uh, Proclivity towards the misinterpretation. I, 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 that, that's a very profound, you know, and thoughtful uh, exercise uh, in terms of thinking: what can we do in order to prevent it in the future? And um, uh, it's easy to say; it's not that easy to do. Uh, we have to be aware of the fact that you know there are limits to what we do. And I used to say that those limits are in our budget. You know that we can, you know, of course we can dream of, you know, preventing any misuse and many is any misinterpretation, but it's not possible. You know, especially in nowadays world when we have social media so powerful and so many people engaging into it, and also so many, I know, evil forces trying to 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 introduce this misinterpretation or misuse. That we need to think of a strategy also, not to kind of like try to treat every single case of that 
but to try to uh, shape our communication towards something that brings the more most value added in terms of the effect gained in terms of preventing misuse and and that's that's another challenge that we have nowadays to, due, due to this you know eruption of the social media but 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 i guess uh, uh, considering limited resources we need a very uh, thought out uh, strategy to to react you know, to what is possible and uh, certainly the this profound feeling of being responsible for the society to be informed properly and then to uh, fight against uh, misuse and misinterpretation. Thank you. Ed, do you have anything you want to add to that? Yeah, three, three points very, very quickly. Firstly, uh, I absolutely agree with what Stephen and Dominic have said. I think there is a responsibility here on producers and a lot of our work actually is not so much policing the use, but it's encouraging producers to clarify what the statistics really mean. Secondly, great example fairly recently, the Office for National Statistics um, uh, uh, made available some figures on death certificates uh, with, with COVID, um, which was subject to some really um, horrendous misuse on social media. Um, and misused so bad that when I was asked about it in Parliament, I refused to actually even talk about it because I thought it was didn't want to give any oxygen to the misuse. What ONS did is they immediately stepped in within, I think, about 24 hours and published a blog very, very clearly saying this is not what those numbers mean. It was an excellent example of responsiveness. So, yes, I think I think it's great when producers do that. Uh, and the third thing is uh, slightly, uh, slightly more lightheartedly. Dominic, I'm a bit dazzled by your vocabulary. Uh, I don't think I've ever used the word proclivity uh, myself uh, in, in so perfectly in the right context. It's very, very impressive. Thank you. Thank um, you. I will now move on to the questions on Slido because I think the top two um, cover exactly the counter to the question that I just asked about what the producers can do. Um, and there are two questions around statistical literacy and how much we should be helping um, with the understanding by improving statistical literacy or how much uh, the media can support statistical literacy and how things are communicated. So I wondered if you had any thoughts on the kind of counter. How much is it for statistical producers? You've already answered but how much is it for improving literacy, statistical literacy in the population? Dominic, shall we start with you? Yeah, yeah, uh, that, that's a very that's a topic very close to my heart because uh, um, we started a few years ago to invest a lot into building uh, statistical literacy and how we do it. We we organize you know different contents contents contests for for uh, for students uh, uh, starting with the primary school, then secondary school, and for the universities as well. So for the for the for the secondary schools, we have this Olympiad that we call Statistical Olympiad, and we got like three thousand of participants every year. And I used to say to those people at the end when we when we have finals organized in our main office that uh, you know uh, uh, this is going to be an army of people who knows what the statistics is about in a 10 years perspective because when we multiply 3000 by 10 we get 30000 of people and it's a huge army of of those who who really understand what the statistics is about what the official statistics is about and they're spread across the country and there are our you know friends and they will spread our our message they will convey our communicate convey our communication to the society and i think it's a long term investment and it's uh, and it's painful because you need to you know you know allocate resources. There's always you know limited budget, whatever. But this is our obligation. And again, it comes out from this profound feeling of of your own responsibility for what is happening, not only within your office but in the environment of this office. And it touches upon a little bit on the other thing that I wanted to introduce to the to to the topic. You know, when we want to effectively fight misuse or and misinterpretation, we cannot be alone. We need to build a very strong network of stakeholders. We need to have and engage into a close collaboration and relationships with, I know, financial analysts, uh, uh, experts in some specific domains that use our statistics so that they not only know exactly what we're producing, but also become over time our advocates in the society. And that's uh, that's another point that is closely related to the issue of literacy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Does Stephen or Ed have anything they want to say? 
Stephen? Uh, yes, I think for me, uh, there are two broad types of misuse, uh, accidental and deliberate. And I think uh, certainly statistical literacy uh, activities can really help with the accidental misuse. Uh, I think of a, an example, uh, I was talking to some colleagues in the statistical office of Uzbekistan recently, and they said that one of their main challenges was that the press just didn't understand enough about statistics to be able to report accurately on, on what was coming out of the statistical office. So they've had a big campaign on statistical literacy in the press as their first step to trying to improve statistical literacy in society more generally. And I think that's improvement of statistical literacy in the press to some extent, but in society more generally is very important uh, where we have deliberate misuse or uh, shall we say selective uh, use of, of statistical information, because I think society really needs to be able to uh, spot this where it happens. Uh, we need allies in the press, in society in general, who can see where statistics are perhaps not being presented uh, in an accurate way and can question what they're seeing. So really helping to build statistical literacy, I think is, is key to developing this partnership between the statistical system and society to prevent the misuse of statistics. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, well, I agree uh, very much with the points that uh, Dominic and Stephen have made. I do, though, quite often find myself slightly pushing back against um, versions of people talking about statistical literacy where what is really being argued is that it's not our problem, it's the problem that the people out there don't really understand our, our statistics. Uh, and I push back in two directions. One is I think that um, when people talk about statistical literacy, they're really talking about three distinct types of knowledge. They're talking about absolutely knowledge of statistics, how to make inferences, the nature of probability, the nature of uncertainty. Um, and that is something that I think the kinds of uh, endeavours that Dominic is talking about are really good for helping with. They really will help raise awareness of how to think about large data sets in aggregate terms. The second thing sometimes people mean is understanding of the statistical system, the system of official statistics, what official statistics are and what they do. And I think that's slightly different. It's helpful and important, people knowing where to go to get answers, for example, uh, but it's not quite the same thing as that understanding of data as statistics. And the third thing people uh, sometimes mean is critical thinking, how people can hear claims, statements being made and learn how to challenge them, uh, be sceptical about them, verify them. And I think if we're not really precise in what we mean, sometimes those three things all get mixed up. Um, and I think it done, then can feed on part of producers of statistics a slight sort of outsourcing of the problem. It's not our problem that that uh, our statistics are being misinterpreted. It's all those people out there who are who are, you know, either they don't understand statistics enough or they don't understand our system or they can't think critically. And I think we should really push back against that. I think that in any given moment, of course, more literacy would be great, but it's the responsibility of the producer to make their uh, their their statistics as accessible and as available and as clear as they possibly can um, and then work in the background to address those three types of literacy that I've mentioned. So I do agree with what Dominic and Stephen says and I do agree with the question but on, on the other hand I think we need to be careful that we don't slip into just kind of outsourcing our problems. Thank you. Thank you very much and we've got a question here specifically for Ed. Can you give some more insight into how you steer clear of politics, media frenzies and personalities? And as a supplementary, which is quite linked, given that we don't see publicity, what happens when government departments say sorry, but very few people know this has happened? So um, the first part of that question, how we steer clear of, of, of politics, um, I think we, we have those principles that I outlined um, right at the heart of every time we we we, we um, look at this. So let me just say a little bit of, of context that we, we have a process that we call casework. And if somebody, a member of the public uh, or the media comes to us and says, I've seen this reporting of statistics and I'm not sure it's right, 
we'll call that a case. We also generate our own cases. We have a, a an automated approach to picking up where there are a, a sort of debates and concerns about statistics, and we look at that on a daily basis. And we will sometimes look at something and say that looks like a case where there's some divergence between what the statistics say and what is being claimed. So we look at the case and once the case opens up, then those principles kick in. And I think it's really, really crucial that we always try and separate out what the political argument is, which is not for us, that's for other politicians and the media to, to debate over, and the use of statistics within that argument. And there have been times where we've um, chosen a very sort of neutral line on something because we think that this debate is not really about the use of the statistics, it's about people not liking the argument being made. There's some cases around child poverty recently which were like that and people were a bit disappointed that we looked like we weren't sort of being, you know, like taking up the sword of, of truth, so to speak. Uh, but we thought it was not a debate about, in Dominic's terms, it was not a debate about the truth. It was a debate about, about different values, about what people were valuing. So we really rigorously focus on that separation of the uh, of, of what is a a debate, which is the which is the proper role of politics, where politicians are arguing or, or making a case about what they how they interpret the world and what they think should be done, and then the way statistics are mobilised into that. And of course, it's worth saying we celebrate when statistics are mobilised. You know, it's great that statistics are part of of discourse. That's what they're there for. I mean, that's fantastic. But we just want to make sure it's being done in a way that doesn't mislead as to what the statistics actually say. So I think if we we have that principle and that's that's how we do it. Of course, there are times when it does get very tricky, when those things get very kind of um, uh, blended together. And that's where I suppose we earn our money by making those judgments as to how clearly and firm we should be uh, and what sort of um, what sort of when the way we articulate our, our concerns. Uh, how we um, uh, respond uh in the case of um the the lack of sort of awareness i think the second part of the question was if i've, if I've got that right if we if we say something and then nothing uh, really gets picked up we don't want to do this in silence or in a, in a darkened room if we put something out onto our website as a public intervention we definitely want there to be clarity about what the statistics say that's why we're doing it we don't want it to be uh, a, a sort of a silent thing. Now, obviously, for us, ideally, the perfect solution is if the interpretation gets corrected quickly and appropriately. Um, and in that case, of course, we don't need to do any more. We certainly don't need any coverage for that. We don't want need to be sort of celebrated for, you know, the great work we've done. We just want the statistics to be used appropriately. But if the case, if the, if it happens that we make an intervention and either it doesn't get noticed or and this does happen uh the relevant part of government says well so what we're going to carry on doing what we do we will then escalate and we do escalate uh, and we escalate uh in a variety of ways an increasing degrees of, of sort of uh, public firmness um are culminating in a direct um uh, intervention from the chair, Sir David Norgrove, who unfortunately can't be here today, from Sir David Norgrove to the relevant government minister. And that's our sort of um, most high profile option. So we certainly uh, don't want to be ignored or for our interventions to stay in the shadows. What we want is for the statistics to, 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 to be interpreted correctly. If that happens, then we're happy. If not, then we will uh, be happy to escalate uh, and, and make a bigger noise. I hope that answers the question. It was a really, really interesting question and sorry for quite a long answer, but I thought it was helpful to give a little bit of the sense of the mechanics of how we do this. Thank you. I found it interesting and I've heard it lots of times before. Um, as a kind of follow on to that, Dominic, there's a question here for you about if you're able to offer any reflections on cultural differences around preventing misuse and do Polish citizens have a different perspective? And it's a good, that's an interesting question because, uh, you know, cultural differ differences are uh, uh, extremely important also in terms of how the official statistics works. You know, this is part of the environment and you have to be aware of that, that there are cultural differences. In terms of Poland uh, explicitly and in particularly, uh, uh, in particular, I, I think uh, 
You know, the, 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 the problem that we have in Poland is probably uh, uh, the overall low level of trust. You know, no matter if it's official statistics or, or, or something else, you know, you, you have to understand that we have this history. We've been kind of part of, a, you know, uh, uh, we we lost our independence. We've been a part of the commu communist bloc. We went out from there, you know, 30 years ago. We were at a fast pace of development. You know, the, the, the society is rebuilding its, you know, uh, its structure uh, uh, in this new setting. And uh, what 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 is the outcome of all that is an uh, overall level of trust and it works both uh, you know ironically it, it can work negatively of course because uh, we want more trust in society because then you know everything goes better but then uh, uh, but it also <laughs> ironically wor works against the misuse and, and, and uh, misinterpretation because people generally don't trust uh, both official statisticians and those who want to <laughs> misinterpret our results and people are very kind of like uh, distance from uh, and, and they're very careful in terms of uh, getting any clue from whatever is being communicated that's it's good, you know, and then uh, it's our, uh, it's our, I would say that's our opportunity in, in terms of my office to build on that and try to inject that trust into society before others can damage our image. And that's what we're trying to do. I think that's, that's a, that's, that's a point where we are at the moment. And I think um, we, we do a lot of uh, interesting uh, 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 activities in this regard, and we have, uh, uh, you know, seen some some successes in that as well. So, the cultural differences are extremely important, but uh, uh, more or less, uh, you know, uh, eventually uh, all the countries, uh, you know, uh, uh, drift to, same, to 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 the same point. I would say, and uh, it's just a difference in time. But certainly, the lessons from one country can be uh, used in the other country. It's just a, a matter of uh, of some years, you know, a few years, ten years, or whatever. But uh, these, uh, you know, more or less, at the end of the day, we are the same. You know, the people are the same everywhere. And uh, uh, let's take advantage of that and learn from each other. That's uh, that's a role for international communities. Thank you. And I think, Stephen, that's a good chance to ask if you've got anything to add, given your experience across a lot of different countries. Yes, I, I would, uh, first of all, fully endorse what Dominic said about uh, bringing people together to share experiences, ideas, best practices. And uh, I think we've seen many areas in official statistics where that has helped. And it's not just a case of, of helping those countries that can be perhaps perceived as further behind. Often uh, we see uh, ideas being shared from countries that have uh, less historical baggage, that have been able to implement something uh, relatively easily because they, they have a more or less a clean slate. And those ideas can then be uh, perhaps uh, fed through to, to countries that are normally considered uh, to be more developed. So I think certainly around this area of uh, building trust, uh, we have some very interesting work that's gone on over the years. We had uh, various uh, European level surveys. Uh, I, I mentioned earlier the challenges uh, for the UK some, I think, 15, 16 years ago when the, the results were particularly poor and uh, how all the, the different countries, at least in Europe, have uh, worked on trust from that time and, and have built up, uh, I think, generally a, a high level. So it's it's a multifaceted issue. It's not just a case of finding ways to uh, try to build trust directly. It's statistical literacy, it's communication. It's uh, just generally the way that the statistical office engages with and is, is perceived by people. So a lot to learn from each other there and uh, a lot uh, that the international community can uh, do to support that learning. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so I've got a question which I think all of you might be in a position to answer. Um, and the question is, what's the most damaging example of misuse of statistics that you have come across in your career? I'll start with Ed, as I suspect this is one he gets asked quite regularly. Um, but Stephen and Dominic, please do think about a response as well. Well, um, actually, I, I do get asked this a lot. Uh, and never in the past have I been able to confine myself to one single example. Uh, so I'll give the answer that I, I I always give to that. 
to that question, which is it's actually a type of misuse, which happens a lot and it really gets my goat. It really annoys me. Um, and it's when you get this sort of really glib and and sort of throw away use of a number in a government press release or a government speech where something is just referred to. We've got, you know, X percent of this or we've done 3000 of that and there's absolutely no source. There's no possibility of, of, of getting down as a, as, a, as, a, as a citizen and finding out where that number comes from and what it means and how the data have been compiled. It's just totally, I call it naked. It's totally naked. Uh, David Spiegelhalter, Professor David Spiegelhalter, who's one of our non-executives, but also obviously a great, a great thinker about public communication of, of data and statistics. He calls it number theatre. It happens a lot and it really annoys me because it's so it's so undermining it it creates the impression that that numbers are just being plucked from a back pocket and they are not actually by and large those are numbers which are being sourced from internal management systems very credibly compiled by analysts to doing a good job and i think to do it so lazily and so in such a superficial way actually trashes the work of the statisticians um and and it, it and of course the public is going to mistrust that because it just sounds like they're a, they're a, um uh, you know th these things are just being sort of tossed out so for me it's not actually a single example it's that generic really annoying pattern i should say that we've been uh, running a very concerted um program of work with central government in the uk to 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 to, to emphasize that it's in the hands of government departments to not do this they don't have to do this they can they can when when numbers go out they can do it in an orderly way but that's for me so sorry it's not one single thing it's a it's a generic really bad habit thank you thank you Stephen I, I have an example from relatively early in my career when I was working in ONS and one of my areas at the time was entrepreneurship statistics and around that time we had coming out of the European Union the Lisbon declaration which amongst many other things said that uh, the EU had to do a lot of work to improve entrepreneurship, to uh, improve the rate of, of business startups and survivals, et cetera, uh, based on a comparison of, of data between Europe and North America. And at that time, I uh, actually went on secondment uh, to OECD to do a project on this topic. And the main conclusion from that was actually really, when you looked at the details, there was no difference. So there was no need for a policy for catch up. And I think this is, in a sense, a little bit like Edward's uh, examples of, of figures being plucked from the air without a real understanding of, of what happens underneath. And I think to me, it was very illuminating at that stage in my career that big political decisions could be based on such a flawed understanding of the underlying data. So I think that's that's the example I'll throw in. Thank you very much. And Dominic. Uh, uh, I'm going to come up with uh, three examples uh, very peculiar to what we observe here in Poland. There's one thing that both that is both humorous and irritating at the same time, because whenever we publish our price statistics, you know, consumer price index, it's being commented by many that probably, you know, the price of the locomotives go down so the price index is not going up that quickly as everybody expects and uh, so you know they always bring in the locomotives into our you know basket of consumer you know uh, good uh, goods and services which is which is very irritated uh, i just told myself that we should buy one locomotive put it in front of our office because it's probably more of our brand than than our than our you know <laughs> than our ad identification in itself uh, anyway the other thing is that they very often bring uh, you know common saying like you know lies them lies uh, statistics this is something that we oh my god that's always a challenge or uh, oh, there are a few people that used to say that me and my dog have on average three legs and I, and I used to silently react and and it and it, it also affects you the side the average size of the brain of both of you you know so but anyway so but I do it in my mind you know never never reacting publicly this way but uh, uh, the one peculiar uh, example that I wanted to mention that happened to to us at the beginning of COVID, that, that there's something that I would call uh, a fake research. You know, that there, there have been some research units, uh, not not very big ones, not not very popular ones, that wanted to take advantage of the pandemic and really kind of like surface. 
and, uh, and, 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 and break about their own capacity and, and whatever. And they started to compete with us in producing statistics on labor market, but uh, with the methods that were very much questionable. And, uh, and of course, uh, you know, uh, we've reacted very quickly. We, we have commanded on the methodology. We have said uh, how, how, what are the differences and that we are, you know, providing also quick statistics in terms of what, what is being uh, uh, demanded from us. And uh, eventually, after a few months, uh, it all just stopped because uh, uh, everybody uh, realized that uh, if they want to really do uh, some profound analysis of the situation, that have to they have to use our data. And, and, and eventually, it ended up uh, uh, nicely. But uh, at the beginning, it was a huge challenge for us as well. So I will introduce another term: fake research. Also, also happens. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We have a lot more really good questions, but with only a few minutes left, I want to give Stephen and Dominic a chance to comment on if there's anything they haven't said yet or anything they've picked up from something somebody else has said. I'm going to leave that out of that for now because Ed's going to do the closing remarks. Um, so Stephen, I don't know whether you want to give a few minutes on reflections or thoughts you've picked up throughout the session. So thank you. Yes, I think it's been a, a great discussion. I'm sure we could uh, carry on for a few more hours on this, definitely. But uh, I think for me, uh, again, it's it's really important to to pick up on a, a couple of the threads that we've heard so far. Uh, first of all, in this area, the importance of international communication, collaboration, sharing ideas, etc. Uh, I think that, that really helps. Uh, we can make use of this huge asset, which is the international statistical community. Uh, second, the importance of statistical literacy and uh, making sure that uh, as far as possible, we can help uh, press uh, society in general, even politicians to maybe understand a little bit more about the, the numbers that are out there and, and how to use them effectively. But I fully agree with Edward that we shouldn't just uh, say that it basically it's their fault. Uh, presentation, communication of statistics are, are really key areas and there I think it's, it's absolutely vital. Again, that we build our own capabilities, that we share information, we share best practices and we do as much as we can to minimise the risk that what we put out there could be misinterpreted or at least to make it perhaps mo more obvious that more of society can spot the, the misinterpretation by the way that we present the data. So I think those for me would be the, the main reflections. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dominic. Uh, okay, so, so I would like to mention a few things uh, because we, we talk about misuse and misinterpretation, but I would add a very important a new part to it, which is no use, <laughs> no use at all. It's also a challenge. And I, I mean, uh, we need to uh, uh, feel uh, uh, a profound responsibility for uh, actually, uh, you know, trying to reach out and sell ourselves. You know, that's, that's what I say to my staff very often. It's not only measurement. You, you, who cares if nobody knows about it? You know, that and nobody is using that. So try to find who is the most willing to engage and uh, and try gradually to build up your relationship with the outside world starting with those who are the closest to you and then you know regularly systematically work on that uh, it's it's always a long term you know strategy it's never something that you can get quickly the other thing that i would stress is very open is open data the idea of open data we need to be in a, at the core of that 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 what happens in poland you know we were we were ranked uh, as the second in the world right after singapore in this global you know open data ranking thanks to it our country within the european union is uh, also ranked very high in the uh, overall open data uh, you know uh, ranking for not only statistics but uh, uh, for the whole public community administration. But I think that's very important that we make the data available as easy as possible. Uh, we ourselves are investing a lot into API. So we try to uh, guarantee the automatic access to our databases, even without any interference with our interfaces like a web or whatever. And the third thing that I would like to add is 
the issue of international cooperation, collaboration, and, and the role of inst inter international institutions. Because these institutions at the beginning, they were very political. They were, you know, established due to political will to have something to cooperate. And then eventually, over time, I have a feeling they drifted towards, you know, producing papers, maybe some, you know, internationally agreed methodologies. But there's also a role for those in international organizations to react when there is a misuse, misinterpretation, or violation of independence uh, uh, at the domestic level somewhere, which these institutions sometimes refrain to do because of the political reasons. Again, uh, I, I think that there has to be some empowerment on the international level in terms of, you know, more agile reacting to uh, any misbehaviors, let's say this way. And the, the last thing that I'd like to mention is uh, the very context of the war. What we see here in Poland is, is war, of course, uh, just right up behind our border. You know, we are reaching to two million of refugees already uh, being in Poland. And it's a, it's, it's a horror, it's a, it's a terrific drama. And, and, I, and I start to think to myself, you know, could we as statisticians do something in before to prevent it? Maybe there is something that we haven't thought of, some kind of a geopolitical statistics that we should also try to think of. Maybe uh, because you know I, I was raised in the primary school at those times, uh, and this environment that taught me that everybody now knows what the terrible thing war is, and this will never happen again to humanity because humanity itself realized that whatever your side is, whether you're an invader or or opponent, you know, uh, you will never win the war. You will always lose it. Uh, it seems that these 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 teachings go away somehow. And uh, maybe there's a role for statisticians as well to communicate in advance things that seem to lead to uh, to horrible things. I know that's that's something that I'm struggling at the moment now. Thank you. Thank you very much and thank you um, all three of you for your contributions. We could, as Stephen said, have lasted a lot longer. There are loads of good questions left and I'm sorry we didn't get to them, but if you do have a look and have thoughts, we can look at how to share them. Um, I think two things I really took from all of that is we definitely benefit from learning from each other, whatever state of progress um, a statistical system is in, there's a lot we can learn from people. And as much as we all have different experiences, there's a lot we share that's really beneficial. Um, so thank you very much from me, but I'm gonna hand over to Ed for some closing comments. Well, th thank you very much. Um, I'm actually just going to invite uh, Stephen to say, uh, answer this question very briefly. Stephen, I, I love the idea of celebrating the 30, 30th anniversary of, of, of these tremendous principles. Um, this is one of a series of events. Could you say something about any further events that, that people might want to engage with? Yes, yes, certainly. So uh, we have uh, a campaign, as I mentioned earlier, we're going through each of the principles, uh, taking about two weeks on each, and we have different countries uh, leading the, uh, the, the celebrations of the different principles. And in each case, we're trying to get some sort of discussion going. We're trying to build awareness. Uh, there's a lot going on on social media. Uh, Twitter, uh, hashtag FPOS30, uh, you'll see a lot that's going on there. We have a, a global network of uh, data officers and statisticians, uh, which is something hosted by my colleagues in uh, New York, UN Statistical Division. And there's also been some discussion on there. Uh, each of the countries that is responsible for a particular principle is either organizing an event like this or making some sort of promotional video or, or various other activities. So there really is a, a lot going on there. Uh, I see Ollie just posted the link to the website in the chat. Thanks for that. Uh, take a look, see what's happening. Uh, Check out uh, Twitter with the, the hashtag FPOS30 and you'll, you'll see all of the activities that are going on there. And then in June, uh, we have our annual meeting of something called the Conference of European Statisticians, which is where we bring together all of the heads of the national statistical agencies in our region and beyond. And there we'll have the formal celebration. We have on the agenda a specific segment where we'll celebrate this uh, 30th anniversary. So yeah, plenty going on. Uh, use the various platforms, websites, social media to keep in touch. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Stephen. And I do encourage uh, everyone in the audience to participate in these things. They're, they're great. So it just um, remains for me to thank uh, everyone. First of all, thank you to the, the team who organised this and pull, pulled this all together. We really do appreciate that. Thank you to you as, uh, as, as attendees for your questions and, and for the time you've spent with us. Uh, I'd like to thank um, Stephen uh, actually for the UN Fundamental Principles. Uh, I've probably never mentioned this to you before, but when we came up with the idea of trustworthiness, quality and value, we were so guided by the UN Fundamental Principles. They, are, they were such a sort of beacon for us about how to think about the democratic value of statistics. So thank you for that. Thank you to Dominic for the emphasis on truth. Uh, and also uh, your very, uh, I think, heartfelt remarks at the end about war. I uh, really do appreciate that. Thank you very much. And finally, thank you to Mary, who did an absolutely superb job stepping in with virtually no notice to chair this uh, really, really nicely. So thank you to all of you. Have a good morning. And just remember, it's our job to make sure statistics are not misused and we'll, we'll carry on fighting the fight, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you.